Welcome to the uh, concurrent session, Digital Credentials and the Future of Licensing, the most exciting session you're going to attend, I think, during the entire conference, to be quite honest. But I'm biased. We worked on this uh, presentation. My name is Frank Myers. I'm a Deputy Legal Counsel for the Federation of State Medical Boards. Um, thank you for again coming to this session. I will be both your moderator as well as one of the panelists here. Uh, during this session, you're going to learn about the efforts underway by the FSMB to modernize the credentialing process through the digitization, and we're going to explore opportunities for in future enhancements through an interactive exploratory dialogue with state medical staff. As I mentioned, my name is Frank Myers. I'm Deputy Legal Counsel. I'm going to go ahead now and introduce the rest of our panelists. Starting from our far right, we have Dr. Collada. Dr. Collada is the Executive Director of the Louisiana State Board of Medical Examiners. Dr. Collada, who began his role with the board in 2017, has been committed to modernizing the board's digital infrastructure, processes, and physical plan. A New Orleans native, he has worked in private practice and on staff at various local hospitals in New Orleans. Most recently, he served as the Chief of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Family Practice Residency Programs at East Jefferson General Hospital. Dr. Collada has a lifetime board certification in obstetrics and gynecology and is a fellow of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecology and the American College of Surgeons. He is past president of the Orleans Parish Medical Society and more recently served as the president of the Louisiana State Medical Society. I said we're going to start on the right, but I'm going to go actually in the order of my script, so we're going to go to Mr. Mike Dugan. Mr. Dugan is the chief operating officer for the Federation of State Medical Boards. Mr. Dugan, who joined the FSMB in 2010, has 30 years of healthcare information technology and operations experience. In his role as the Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Dugan is responsible for FSMB's data and credential, credential verification operations and the supporting technologies. Mr. Dugan's work at FSMB includes researching how dig digital credentials can be used to improve licensure and credentialing processes and promoting this work with industry partners. Prior to joining FSMB, Mr. Dugan held roles at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas, and is this the Perot Systems Healthcare? Next up, we have Ms. Christine Fairley. Ms. Fairley serves as the Executive Director of the Maryland Board of Physicians, uh, which she's been with since 2013. She joined the board as an investigator in 2007 and has held several key roles, including Director of Administration and Deputy Director. Ms. Farrelly's focus at the board has been improving efficiencies and outcomes in the licensure and disciplinary processes. After Maryland joined the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact in 2018, Ms. Farrelly was appointed, <clears throat> excuse me, was appointed an Interstate Medical Licensure Compact Commissioner and subsequently served on the Compact's Rules and Executive Committees and in elected positions of Treasurer and Vice Chair. She is currently working on two projects, creating a reciprocity agreement with Washington, D.C. and Virginia, and partnering with the Federation of State Medical Boards on an API integration project. Last but most certainly not least, Mr. Micah Matthews has served as Deputy Executive and Legislative Director of the Washington Medical Commission since 2014. He began his work in regulatory affairs as an intern with the state's nursing board in 2009. Mr. Matthews participates in multiple industry groups, including the Council of Licensure, Enforcement, and Regulation, also known as CLEAR, for which he chaired the administrative and legislative committees, and is currently serving a second term on the CLEAR Board of Directors. Mr. Matthews also has served as a member of the FSMB's work group on marijuana and medical regulation, audit committee, and board executive advisory committee. This is our panel. I want to thank them again all for taking the time here today to join in this presentation. As I mentioned, this is all about digital credentials and the future of licensing. Uh, this is a little overview of what we're going to be talking today about what is our vision, what are the current FSMB projects related to digital credentialing, what are some of the obstacles that we run into and we may run into in the future, and what those future needs may be. And then I think last, but definitely in my mind, the most important is the viewpoint from our state medical boards and what are those processes and what are, what are they that need to be done. So our vision is one that is digital, it's one that's interconnected, and it's one that's expedient. 
Uh, when I say digital, I don't mean just paperless. A lot of us uh, boards have gone traditionally paper or may still be paper, and the first stage of that transition to some sort of digital future is really just a paperless. You're switching paper out for PDFs. So when we speak about digital, we're not just talking about those digital PDFs. Digital includes data and the better potential for automation through data sharing and data automation. Uh, the future is also, as I mentioned, is inter interconnected with systems automatically communicating with each other. This will replace the need for manual data entry uh, and allow, which is both time consuming and in inefficient, and it eliminates the need for redundant requests for information. If that system is interconnected, what is the need for us to re-request the same documents over and over again? And because of all these changes, the future is expedient. All of these enhancements are designed to make processes faster, uh, if not instantaneous, which then can help us process and issue licenses quicker without having to sacrifice any of the security uh, and, and authority of the boards themselves. So I just went through a lot of words and terms, so we wanted to kind of touch upon definitions, and definitions are important in any discussions in medicine, uh, but it's even more so when we're talking about the, the digital landscape we have in front of us. There's a lot of different terms we go out, that we throw out there. So I talked about digital information here. We define digital information as credentialing data that's verified, stored, accessed, and updated without the need to download. It's fully electronic. You'll hear a lot of us talk about APIs. What is an API? Well, an API is an application programming interface. That's technology which allows multiple parties to access and query digital information. There's no need to have to rebuild a system. We've all got our own independent computer systems, or we may be looking at new systems. And so when there's all the cost and bureaucracy that's involved in creating that, uh, APIs are a way to get you that information and get that information to multiple parties using the existing systems that they have. And lastly, we're talking about query. That's the ability to search databases and access verified provider credentialing components nearly instantaneously. Mm -hmm. And I want to focus there on the term verified because that's an important factor that a lot of boards worry about is whether or not this information is trusted, verified, and primary source. And there's no reason that that cannot be achieved through electronic means, and in fact, it is achievable and is capable today. I'm gonna turn it over now to Mr. Mike Dugan, who's our Chief Operating Officer for the Federation, and he's gonna talk a little bit about our uh, digital current, current digital credentialing projects. Okay, thank you, Frank. Welcome, everyone. It's great to uh, meet again. I know we've said it a number of times this week, but it really is great to be back in person. We always enjoy presenting an update. Here's things that we've worked on. I'm excited to be uh, at a concurrent session and to be on the uh, panel uh, with board members. So that is, that's great. I have to uh, probably apologize in advance, though. I'll probably do a better job with the presentation the second time I give it. So, uh, uh, you're sorry about that. Let's see here. So well, these are our, I say current projects. I think on Hank's slide we talked about it as digital, maybe F, current digital projects. So these really are, this is sort of our digital portfolio, if you will. I'll give some project updates and hopefully that paints a picture of some of the things that uh, we've been working on, but also I, we hope it starts a conversation about things we haven't done yet, but the possibilities uh, that we can be there. And I'll, I'll say all of, the, all of the systems that we do, all the work that we do is to assist medical boards. So this isn't, uh, you know, for our own benefit. We really are here to help the members. Uh, digital credentials, we have a lot to talk about digital credentials. We spend a lot of time thinking about it, talking about it. Uh, uh, I'm going to start with FCVS, which is an important piece of our uh, digital credential plan, but I think the headline with FCVS uh, is an operational efficiency. Uh, so a couple of the bullet points are uh, we've got a greater than 40% volume increase over the last three years. I think the numbers. Uh, 43-ish. Uh, our cycle times really haven't changed uh, with those volumes, and uh, staffing levels are essentially the same. And we've been able to do that, and we measure quality. We're quality certified. Uh, we measure it ongoing. It's very important to us. Uh, excuse me. Thank you. 
I forgot to grab that before I started. Um, the, um, so the uh, quality hasn't been impacted. So before I get into the last bullet, a couple things. The 40% increase, it's probably not a surprise to anybody because you know we're just a, a picture, an aggregate picture of the boards. Just about everybody I've talked to, all the boards are seeing that same volume increase. The other thing, the staffing levels, they have not increased, but it's not because, oh, we, you know, I'm uh, cost cutting or we need to keep the cost down. We're actually a handful of positions short uh, from what we would see as optimal, but it's just uh, we're going through the same thing that everybody's going through with that one, too. Uh, there's some turnover uh, that maybe we didn't expect, and then, you know, recruiting and bringing new resources on is as challenging as we've seen it. So... Uh, but those have set the stage, and we have, uh, I think we've been able to accomplish these things in large part because of what I'll talk about on the last bullet there, and, and it starts with a lean process, uh, a focus on the lean process improvement. Now, we have a history with lean. Uh, historically, we've done projects, so we identified a, a process that was inefficient or we thought we could improve. Uh, we'd bring somebody in, we'd evaluate, project had a start and end date, maybe we'd fix it, and then we'd move on. Uh, this time, we've taken a different approach, and we had started this just before the pandemic, but we are focusing on educating leaders on the FCVS team. Uh, and I should point out Misty Wolf uh, in the audience who leads our FCVS team is here. But uh, we focused on an education and training program and really, instead of just a project, building it in uh, lean principles into the way we work. So two years later, on the lean uh, front, uh, we have someone who's certified as a black belt and has progressed from green belt to black belt and another individual who is certified as a green belt. And you know, they're process champions, uh, they're not the only people working on lean, though. It's it, everybody. And for those, those of you that don't know, my sort of post-it note on lean, it's, it's a focus on standardizing, which helps drive quality, you know, standardization, but then eliminating non-value-add steps. So that's an important piece, and I, those things really do play a role in us being able to, to meet the parameters that we've met. I think it's important that you start with the process improvement before you get to automation. Uh, you know, we, and we have done automation. However, a bad process automated is still a bad process. So that really comes uh, after uh, we've evaluated things. There are some great tools out there for workflow automation, you know, that, that are available. Uh, we have targeted tasks that are repetitive and very predictable. And, uh, you know, that may sound easy, but the fact is that uh, staff was spending a lot of time on these things. And, uh, and maybe their value add, but their mental uh, focus on this really wasn't adding. It was sort of just checking the box. And now we have doing that, do a lot of that in an automated fashion. So the other piece related to digital, uh, to cycle time, I would tell you, are digital signatures. So we have been working with digital signatures. For those of you that don't know FCVS, it's a cre credential profile. Uh, the main elements are medical education, graduate medical education, and then the board background. So this is, we're a CVO. We reach out to the training and education programs, and they verify the information of the applicant. So in the not too distant past, this was, we'd print out the form, mail the form, they'd sign the form and mail it back. We are down to, uh, so years ago, we was like, okay, we've gotta go with digital signatures. And uh, we've been at it for a number of years, but in the, in the, we've done a real push, I'd say in the last three or so years, and we're really down to outliers, programs that are, will not, uh, haven't accepted digital signatures yet. So the, the, we're in the high 90s there. Our tool of choice for dig digital signatures is DocuSign. We've been a long partner of theirs. Um, it's, it's been a good tool for us. It's a uh, well-known product. They continue to make enhancements, and we don't, 
implement everything, but it has, we've grown with the tool as well. So that's been, uh, that's been rewarding. And the other thing, okay, it took out mail and, and, it, and we can do it faster, but uh, we can show you numbers, it's just, it is safer, it is uh, more verifiable, uh, the audit process is better, uh, things aren't tampered with, so it, it's just a, uh, uh, it, it's just a better process. All right, so I'll segue. Uh, we have a closed program service that we provide. A Little bit of background. Uh, we've been doing this for years. Uh, the audience may not be uh, familiar with it, but every year training programs close. Primarily funding maybe runs out. Sometimes a whole hospital will close. So for uh, longer than I've been with the Federation, programs have been shipping, had been shipping boxes of paper and then we would field requests from uh, primarily hospitals, I think, to do verifications on these, and everybody had their own version of a form. So it was really it was an awful process. We had all this paper, we didn't know when it was gonna be called on, and then you didn't know which pieces of the paper you were gonna need to complete the form. Well, uh, a few years ago, there was a, a group that uh, included the ACGME, the uh, American Hospital Association, uh, the Joint Commission was involved, and the National uh, Staff, Medical Staff Services Association. And I'm leaving at least one group out. But they came up with a standard. They had had it with the uh, many flavors of the forms as well. And this was very powerful for us because now we had a standard data set that we could uh, request from a program and say, we don't want your paper anymore, we need this data, and this, these are the fields that we need. So that, the, the standardization of that form dovetailed with some uh, research that we had been doing around digital credentials. So when blockchain became the, the headline story, however many years ago, I know we still talk about Bitcoin, but early on, it was all you could read about. So we said, well, maybe there's something to this. We did research, we compared, uh, we, because we think the intent, as Frank mentioned, uh, is a worthy one and worth pursuing, but rather than just saying, well, we should implement blockchain, we did a sort of technology comparison, and we have uh, landed on digital signatures. The next project I'm gonna talk about is Provider Bridge, and that gives you an example of what we've, what we've implemented. But it's, uh, we did, we did the research, we continue to watch the trends in this and if there's changes being made. Uh, higher education is a, uh, a space where this is quite active and we monitor that space, even attend a conference or two and try to see what's going on there because uh, diplomas and transcripts are going digital and there, there's literally, there's a worldwide, there's a worldwide group that meets every year and talks about this. But uh, we're downstream from that, you know, with medical education. And uh, it's gonna be, you know, you have, have to consume, we're gonna have to consume it anyway. Uh, one of the, the key components here is that this technology enables the physician custody of documents. And that's probably something we could have a session on and talk about, that sort of, you know, the CVO model that sort of uh, perhaps is a mental disconnect, but we're, we're firm believers in this, and we believe that with the uh, traceability and the verifiability of these documents, that it's a, it's a great concept, and we, we certainly support it. So, we had done this, we were headed this way with closed programs, and then there was a pandemic. So early in the pandemic, we had, we fielded a lot of questions and uh, requests for help from uh, New York State was a big one. They'd put up a website, people were volunteering, and they had to vet 50,000 names. So their data set was, uh, I would say, less than our model data set, and we had to try to sift through it. Uh, we helped, there was some large health systems and other state uh, they really weren't medical boards, right? As, as you would know, it was, you know, the state uh, uh, response agencies were involved. So as we got in this, we thought, boy, it'd be great if there was a standard on this. And 
uh, our chief advocacy officer, Lisa Robin, who I presumably is known to m most of you, if not all of you, uh, has uh, ongoing conversations with HRSA. And uh, we kind of uh, talked to them about it. They said that oh, that could be a good idea. We presented a proposal and we received a grant to create what's called Provider Bridge. And I think this is where I'm, uh, some of you may have seen we had a booth. Uh, where we gave out socks that uh, we may be running low on the socks, but uh, they I think they've been quite a hit but the um, I am wearing a pair, but I thought rather than I'm afraid I'll I'm not very coordinated. So uh, I didn't want to fall over I'll give these to Frank uh, the the uh, so this is a goal this 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 slide is just a goal a, a goal of the uh, the grant and, you know, HRSA was a great partner, but we had to report, right? We said we were going to do it. You have to report on the grant and show your progress toward the goal. So a couple things of note. And their focus was on enabling uh, telehealth services during the pandemic. Now, this, so that would require a new technology platform uh, for mobilizing physicians. And key phrase here, during public health emergencies. This tool is not intended to bypass any existing, certainly any licensing sort of process or system, but or any uh, credentialing process or system. It's really designed as an emergency tool. And I'll show you a sample of the report. It's a high level. It's intended to be a quick vet of a professional. So uh, another goal, you know, this was not a, we, uh, we used a partner and we helped develop it, but this is not an FSMB tool, it's not an FSMB new database. Uh, a key component was it, whatever we're going to build needs to be able to be uh, tap into multiple professions. So that was the design, that was a key part of the, the design. So this, we love our umbrella slide, this shows you the rainy day, but on the end we have a NCCPA and the ABMS who are long-standing data partners of ours and we share data with them uh, on a uh, daily or weekly basis. And they partnered in the sense that they allowed us to extend the use of our current agreement to be uh, part of this tool. So that was great. And we also, a new development partner was NCSBN. So they, NCSBN, had a little more heavy lifting to do. And they did two things. They created a, an, an API, as Frank uh, taught us the definition there, an API into the system, but they took the time to put it in their uh, nursing portal work queue. So if you're a nurse and you got in, it says, hey, you, if you may want to look into this. And I'll tell you as a result, people, the nurses uh, use that portal, and I think we're approaching 100,000 uh, pings from nurses who were interested and wanted to uh, partake in the program. So. Uh, we're excited about the, the, uh, the platform. Uh, quite honestly, the, uh, the, you know, we, we had to, the runway to develop it, and we worked very quickly, but a lot of people had, from a COVID standpoint, um, uh, come up with, you know, they, they had made their own uh, mechanisms for these, and then, you know, at the start, people were moving and then volunteering. Well, it didn't take too long. I don't, I'm not going to drive to New York. They need my help here in, this, in my state because uh, it was everywhere. So, but this is, uh, hopefully you can see this uh, in the back. Uh, if not, this is always something we can provide. This is the, I'll call it the, uh, well, it's a report. Um, and uh, this is what the, uh, the, the uh, 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 caregiver receives when they go on and register and load their report. So there's a couple things that are important here. The, uh, in these situations, the timeliness of the report is critical. So we made the date of issue, you see up there in the upper uh, right, a, as big as possible. Just so you know, this, you know, this wasn't a report from two years ago. Uh, we have some key demographic information, and then most importantly, board actions. Has this person been, ever been sanctioned or been in trouble? Because I think we all know as regulators, emergencies uh, draw out bad actors. So the, the rate of incidents compared to regular environments is uh, double or higher. 
So we wanted that to be up front. And I don't have a, I didn't put the sample of the if action is found, but it's a, it's a large stop sign. It's visually, you can't miss it. Uh, and then we have some roll-up uh, information about specialty certification, uh, active licenses. We don't have get into statuses or dates. It's just here's an active license in this state. Again, looking at summary information. And then um, uh, DEA uh, uh, numbers are, are on the report as well. So this report, uh, page one of it, I should say, the, the, the report itself is one page. Using these credentials, you know, is somewhat new, and it's a new process for folks. So the first page is really an instruction sheet uh, because, it's, you know, we hope that usage of these becomes second nature and very, uh, uh, you know, everyday sort of thing uh, in these settings. But uh, the, it tells you how to verify it. So there's a signature panel. It's a blue, what's called a blue ribbon PDF. Click the signature panel, and it gives you where this document was signed. We went through, we got specific digital certificates, just like are used in, you know, in websites, and you get the certificate is out of date, uh, registered certificates, so you can see uh, it was signed by FSMB. So that, that's a key part of it. We also added a, uh, if, uh, on our website, it's, uh, is it certified.fsmb.org. You can take the document, drop it in, and it'll tell you if it's one of our documents. Say you don't trust this, if you wanted to test it. We have a database. Each document has a digital uh, fingerprint, and we, we're, you're able to check that online in real time. Okay, so that's Provider Bridge. Uh, another project is uh, AVR, it is, uh, we love acronyms, is Attribute Verification Report. This is work that we did with the, uh, the Medical Licensing Compact, and uh, many of you may be members of the Compact, uh, so I, at the risk of being redundant, for uh, the way the Compact works, an applicant has a state of principal licensure, and if they want to apply to other states, the state of principal licensure goes through a checklist to make sure that they qualify for uh, licenses in the compact states. So there's a couple things that we can help with uh, via data, right? The, there's a background check, and then there's a, uh, you have to check records for investigation, current investigations. That's, that's out of our hand. But if you look at a lot of the other attributes, we have source data that can be used to verify these. And instead of going to the perhaps four different places, uh, we can put it in a report. And I wish the report was a little bigger. Uh, but the uh, board actions, again, is always at the top of mind. So that's there at the top. And you can see there's a green font meets IMLCC standards. Uh, we have the uh, ACGME data, uh, USMLE exam attempts. This was an interesting one for us because, you know, we have USMLE exam data, but we can't just provide everybody uh, with a free exam the, uh, transcript. This allowed us, this isn't a transcript. This answers the question, do, do, do they meet the attempts limits? So we were able to just answer the question it's asked, boil that down to the one question, and it saves the step of staff having to go to wherever they store the USMLE transcripts and check, you know, checking the, uh, the information on that transcript. So we think that that's a powerful concept. Uh, and then the last one is the ABMS certification history. I have, uh, uh, I guess, the, uh, as we work through this process, and this is implemented. This is live, the first version of it, and I'm told that it has been very well received. The, the, our volumes have gone way up. I think everybody has seen uh, the compact volumes are doing the same thing and maybe even at a steeper curve for, than we have. Uh, so that's a lot of work for these print states of principal licensure. So I think this has been very well received and we're excited to announce that uh, we're working with the AMA as a source for the uh, GME data. They're a recognized complete source, uh, I guess primary source equivalent, and uh, this is a, an integration that we're going to do. So just like on the... Um, uh, the other report, it'll be API-driven. 
if the report's requested, we make a call to the AMA and how, while we're building this report, populate the report and send it on to the, um, the IMLCC system. So that integration is exciting. The other thing I would say, you know, I think this opens up some possibilities. We, uh, you know, we could perhaps see this you, uh, offered, or we would offer it, for non-compact licenses. Perhaps each state has their own criteria and uh, maybe want to do it a little bit differently, but we have the basis for this, and we would be delighted to work with any states if you think this could help you with your uh, operational processes. And on that note, too, the, I think there's um, perhaps a, one of our challenges maybe is awareness of some of the, the data that we have. And, uh, you know, we have data from all of the boards, all of our members, all of you. Uh, we have complete licensure and discipline data. And it's, uh, we have it to make it available to you know, other states. Uh, we are viewing agents uh, for specialty data for ABMS and the AOA. We've started this new uh, agreement with the AMA, and I think that that implementation is potential. They're willing to work with us. They share freely with state medical boards, and they're fine ha having us be a conduit of their data. So we're working with them on that. Uh, CMS, DEA, and also NPDB. If... Uh, there's a, you know, a lot of people probably go out separately or have the physician go out separately and make the call to NPDB, and uh, we have a full integration of them, and it can all be initiated in one space. So, and, uh, you know, I, I mentioned these projects. Another project of ours was Frank, bringing Frank on as a, a, a new staff member, and we're very excited about it, and, you know, we've, we're, uh, uh, we love the technology projects. We, you know, we love trying to bring solutions. We're excited. Frank brings a perspective uh, of an executive director uh, and an attorney, and we think that uh, and you know relationships with with many of you. So we're looking forward to to building that into these. And as we brought Frank on, we had a uh, sort of a uh, what would you call that? The work that we did. It was a uh, uh, strategy session and you know you do everybody's done them but part of it is you come up with your uh the goal what's your main objective what's your uh, motto here and we boiled it down to uh, something to the effect i can't quote it exactly but in a um, changing regulatory environment we strive to be your trusted source for information so uh we we think we have a good basis here and i look forward to continuing the conversation Oh, yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mike. I'll give you the money later for that shout out. <laughs> um, so as you see from Mike, he's gone over uh, what our processes are, what our current projects are. And I want to talk a little bit about what some of those roadblocks and future needs and hurdles that we're, we're, we're addressing. Um, okay. So a lot of... Um, a lot of the hurdles and roadblocks, I'm not gonna stick on my picture, but I need my notes, so you're gonna have to look at my face. Um, a lot of the roadblocks we face is, you know, can they trust it? Is this information primary source? Uh, my laws or my regulations don't allow me to use this or that. Um, and quite honestly, the last roadblock is a cultural one. It's this is not how we've traditionally done this process. We've always done it this way, it's worked for us. We really don't want to change it. And that cultural roadblock, you can see at multiple levels. It may be at the board level, the executive level, and it may be at the staff level. And so these are all challenges that have historically kind of slowed down the process of shifting to this, this new digital, digital environment. So I'm going to touch on each one of these roadblocks as we go through. The first one I want to talk about is primary source. We all have probably heard the term primary source. Uh, we all quote it as this document, this verification needs to be primary source, but what does that mean? Uh, we all ask if it's primary source. I think we all agree that we know it's primary source if it comes directly from the issuing institution, if the transcripts come from the medical school, if the licensure verification comes from state A, B, or C. 
if the postgraduate training verification comes from that dean or whomever, despite the fact that I don't think anybody really knows who was the dean of, of that program at that time. Primary source, what I have up here is the definition from the Joint Commission Accreditation Manual. It's the verification of an individual practitioner's reported qualifications by the original source or an approved agent of that source. And the methods for conducting primary source verification of credentials include direct correspondence, documented telephone verification, secure electronic verification from the original qualification source, or as I've highlighted here, or reports from credentials verification organizations, also known as CVOs, that meet joint commission requirements. And I've highlighted that last one because that's something I think a lot of us overlook. I think a lot of us overlooked a lot of these. I don't know about anybody here making telephone calls and accepting that as a primary source, but accepting documents that come from CVOs as primary source, those meet joint commission standards. And for those that I'm, again, I'm assuming everybody knows the Joint Commission, but the Joint Commission ha sets hospital standards, and those basically set the standards for what it takes to be accredited as a hospital, and these are the requirements that our providers meet to be employed, and therefore essentially be licensed. It's kind of a trickle-down hierarchy. So focus so much on a CVO. What is a CVO? Well, first of all, I should clarify that the Federation is a CVO. Federation of State Medical Boards is certified by the National Committee for Quality Insurance, called NCQA, as a credentials verification organization. This means we are verified, and we've got a little, I don't know how well you can see it, that's our certificate of, uh, from the NCQA, and that, that specific one right there is about education and training, but we actually are certified for education and training, which includes our medical school transcripts and postgraduate verifications. We're certified for medical board sanctions, that's board disciplinary actions. We're certified for license to practice, that's verification of a state license. We're also certified for the ongoing monitoring of sanctions, so that's any updates to the disciplinary actions as they come through. And we're also certified for Medicare and Medicaid sanctions, so such as uh, CMS exclusion lists and other such documents. So what this means is that the data you get from the Federation through some of those products that we've identified, through FCVS, through the Physician Data Center, those are primary sourced. Now again, I know boards question that and, and they have issues and, and this is one of the things we have to get the message out is that those are primary sources. There's no reason that you can't trust those. But primary source is not the only hurdle. Other hurdles are legislative hurdles. So even if it may be primary source and it may meet your primary source needs, sometimes the legislation or the regulations prohibit us from accepting those documents. I've got up here a citation uh, from my prior role when I was executive director for the District of Columbia. This is one of our regular, uh, sorry, not one of our regulations. This is actually a citation to the code um, saying how uh, applicants have to have their certified transcripts from all medical and pre-medical, if applicable, education sent directly from the educational institution to the board. So, and I don't know how many people think about this when they're thinking of their processes, but a lot of our laws, a lot of our regulations are a bit outdated. They're, they've been around for a very long time. Yesterday I did a presentation and we had individuals from the Virgin Islands who mentioned that they haven't updated their regulations since the 1950s. So there's a lot of outdated um, requirements there that need to be looked at and need to get updated. And we at the Federation, our legal team and others, we're happy to help you know, work with our state boards to get those changes, uh, help draft some of those changes or provide guidance on what kind of changes may be needed so that you can accept these documents that sh technically meet all your requirements, but because of a little nuance in your laws or your regs, you can't accept. But legislative is not the only one. I mentioned you know, the primary source, I mentioned the leg legislative. I think cultural hurdles are actually quite honestly one of the biggest hurdles that we're running into. Uh, and when I say we, I mean we as a licensure, the community. Um, you know, past practices are always a big one. What I heard as executive director from my own staff, you know, that's not how we did it. You know, before I came there, well, we always did it this way, or we always did it that way, or, you know, why do you want to change it this? Why do you, it, it worked, it worked for us, you know, this, this causes a little bit more work. All, you know, questions from somebody that's being told to do something, um, but it, and it helped to take the time to try and explain things. Sometimes it didn't, but a lot of times it did. 
to understand that you know things are not static. Things change. Things evolve. Medicine is evolving daily. Uh, it had evolved a lot over the last couple of years in response to COVID. And so we as regulators need to evolve and respond as well. So past practices may have been great for then. Um, they didn't do so well during COVID. Uh, almost, in fact, I think all the states issued some sort of emergency waiver or regulation or order waiving licensure requirements or instituting some sort of emergency licensure in response to COVID. If I would argue that if we had a digital process in place, licensure could have kept going the way it was, and we could have issued those licenses in time, or at least more timely than we were able to, to avoid some of the issues that came up with the waivers. Uh, kind of connected to the past practices is the reluctance to change. It's not just that I am emphasizing, you know, this is the way we do it. They may be open to change, but they're not open to change of a different type. You know, they're, I can convince staff that this paper document now verifies five things that you had to get as five separate documents previously, maybe they could still get their brains around the paper. But going completely to some sort of new digital system, sometimes it's a little bit more difficult. There's a little reluctance to change. And that's not just on staff, that's across the board. Again, we saw it in people's response to having to learn how to work remotely and work from home. I don't know about you, but how many times you had to ask and remind somebody to mute their microphone. Uh, you know, change is just something that even if you're not reluctant to, it's just something to slowly adapt to. And then the big one is the fear of the unknown. I'll emphasize fear there. I can't tell you the number of times you hear about, well, but what if, but what if, but what if, you know, this doctor gets licensed and uh, state A licensed them, but, you know, what if we find something that's different? You know, or what if um, they lied or something? That happens with paper. Fraudulent activity has happened with paper. It has happened for a long time. I think every board has had an experience with identifying someone that's committed to some level of fraud, whether it be complete identity theft, to lying about a question, and which then gets caught usually on an automated report, the National Practitioner Data Bank, the AMA, um, the AMA report, or the FCVS, or something else that catches those things. So, you know, the fear is something that we have to, we have to get past because the, un the unfortunate thing is that as regulators, as medical board regulators, every doctor that's ever engaged in bad behavior was vetted and was licensed. Um, that's not counting the unlicensed doctors that lie about being licensed, but those that engage that are licensed providers, they were vetted. They had the credentials and they got licensed. We can't always see the future. All we have is a, a picture of the now. And that's what we rely on when we, we license these people. So those are a lot of the hurdles that we've got to face and a lot of the things we got to go over. Um, and I think the best viewpoints on some of those hurdles and what we're doing now and how we address those in the future is, is from our, our boards. So we have here um, a panel of our uh, representatives from various boards. And I have a couple questions that we're going to go through and give them a time and a chance to speak themselves. And then I'd like to open it up to the floor about questions they may have about some of the products and some of the services we had. Before we get to those, though, I want to go back and quickly just ask a question of, the, of those in attendance. If I can get back to the slide. Because Mike went through a lot of our great products. But I'm just curious, how many people here have heard of the Physician Data Center? OK. How many people have here have heard of Doc Info? It's great. How many people have here have heard of FCVS? It's even better. Um, how many people have heard of Provider Bridge? And then I'm going to last. I'm going to ask about the attribute verification report and see if you know if if Mike's got a team that can really sell better than I thought. And we got a couple hands, so that's good. Um, so those are, again, those are the products we have, and I think you saw from Mike's presentation, a lot of those products currently are in the forms of forms that we send or we issue. I think the future is going to involve more about, we mentioned API integration, which we do a little bit of already. Um, but, you know, you see with the AVR, our goal is not to give you a report that your staff then has to manually data enter, which then creates more work. Our goal is to be able to feed that to you directly. And with IMLC, I believe that is what, the, what is currently happening with them. Is it a direct feed or is it generated as a report that gets sent to them? It's sent as a report to them. Okay. System, yes. So I'm going to go ahead and go forward back to where. 
So here is our presenters, our, I should say our panelists. We have Christine Fairley, as I mentioned earlier, the Executive Director for the Maryland Board of Physicians. We have Micah Matthews, the Deputy Executive for the Washington Medical Commission. And we have Vincent Collada, who is the Executive Director for the Louisiana Board of Medical Examiners. So to start this discussion off, I'm going to ask a question of our panel uh, and, and, and try and see what their, um, if I can move this down, and get their feedback and impressions on some things. So one of the questions I have here and, I'm, and I kind of ended my presentation on fears, but one of the things I'd like to ask the panel are, are there fears that the EDs have around moving from paper to digital? Um, is there something there that is just an overwhelming fear that's kind of stopping that process? And I'll start with, uh, I'll start with Christine. Um, I actually would echo your comments, Frank, because I think it's staff. I mean, I don't have a problem, but my licensure analysts, um, unless they have a paper, they don't even have like a life, you know, I mean, they just hold on to it so tightly. Um, you know, it's, it's very um, hard to move forward. But I do think like the interstate uh, compact was a step in the right direction, um, you know, because we have to rely on other states and we have to um, take that information. So I do think that's a small step forward, but um, I think I would need a whole new licensure staff, probably, if I wanted to go digital. <laughs> <laughs> Micah? Yeah, so um, we converted to, we did two things in, during the pandemic. The first one is we converted to an all paperless process by necessity because we had to send all of our people home in the span of 48 hours. Um, and so <clears throat> they started off coming in and grabbing paper and bringing it home for the week. That was not a great process, but we were able to convert. We still have some holdouts who would love us to go back to um, paper, even though we have completely converted, we've process mapped out the whole thing, and now we work out of a queue as opposed to alphabetizing the professions and based off of your alphabet, you get it. Um, the other thing we did was, was uh, activate the healthcare practitioner volunteer registration system in Washington. And we use, just full disclosure, we, I didn't have the staff or resources to have my licensors take this on. And so I had three non-licensing people verify through DocInfo over 9,000 applications through, through that system. And we relied on that information entirely and we successfully caught the bad people that tend to come out during pandemics um, and we're, you know, gently turn them away towards the door. So it, it can be done. It's just a matter of, I think so, I heard someone say yesterday, there's a deep abiding love of paper. And, uh, and that's, I think that was the best way I've heard it described for some of my staff. Dr. Collada. Well, let me start by saying that our fear of paper goes back to a long time ago if you're a physician. I don't think any of us are really happy with the computer programs we use every day in the practice of medicine because they generally were not written to gather patient information and exchange information about our patients. They were designed and written to get best billing practices for our institutions. When I arrived at the Louisiana State Board of Medical Examiners, we had about 3,500 linear feet of paper files, and we had a computer system. So when I spent my first day in my licensing analyst compartment and area, everybody was working with paper and nobody was using the computer, and I said, well, why aren't we using the computer? Well, it doesn't work. I said, so how long have we had it? Oh, five years, Dr. Kalab. I said, well, if it doesn't work, let's find one that does work. But really what we were seeing was an attempt to utilize a good system that wasn't not necessarily perfect, but it was a good system by people who were so used to using paper that they just couldn't make the change because it didn't do exactly what we wanted it to do. And as you heard, the, in those days, they were sending the FCVS as a paper document. To give you an idea of that workflow, it would go from our mailroom to licensing to the appropriate analyst. That, then the analyst would data enter all of that stuff into the computer or not. And then the file would be, paper file would be updated. 
Uh, it just didn't make sense. But people cling to what works for them and what they feel comfortable with. So my challenge was to first find out why they were not comfortable and improve the infrastructure, change the system. And then we still had holdovers. I brought them as good a system as we could find with a great backplane access to the internet, cloud-based. And I said to them, okay, by November 30th, I would like all, and we're talking about, I've been talking to them in May, no more paper charts on your desk. Everything will be in the computer. That's just before COVID hit. COVID hits and I'm saying, great, we can work from home. We have the technology, we have the infrastructure, we have the security systems, and everybody can work from home. And my allied health professional licensing director, and you need to know we license 15 classes of medical providers. My allied health professional licensing director said, you mean us? You mean you wanted us to put all that in the computer? I said, yes, I did. So a lot of people got their feelings hurt because they couldn't work from home but other people could work from home. And so we, we very rapidly, that was an interesting thing because the paper they held on to, they were quick to get rid of and go back. And, and so COVID actually kind of helped us make that transition. But it takes something like that to rip the paper out of people's hands and hearts. As a follow-up to that, other than a pandemic, what else do you think you could do to convince your staff to give up the paper? And that's a question open to all of you. letters of expectation and reprimand were damn near useless, so it took a pandemic. No, I, I, I agree with you. In DC, we, it took us until that to, to get from paper to, to digital. Uh, question from the, from the audience? Is it time? Well, it says Q&A, but I wasn't sure if it was time. Well, I was, gonna, I was using this to spur some discussion, so I'm happy if there's anyone at any point in time comes up with a question, please come up and okay. uh, speak Thanks. to the mic. Uh, Nikki Chopsky, Idaho Board of Medicine. Um, we're an umbrella agency, so we've got lots of boards in our bureau. Board of Pharmacy has managed to go paperless. And um, some of the other boards, is, they were all independent agencies. We recently became an umbrella, so we're figuring out how do you do it, how do you do it, how do you do it. Pharmacy says we're paperless. Medicine's not there yet. But what has helped this, what you're talking about besides a pandemic, is to reassure the staff that they will still have a job when they don't have paper. And it reminds me kind of of um, when you start working with computerized physician order entry or something like that. And you know, pharmacists were used to having paper orders or paper prescriptions. And now you just log into a work queue and everything's in the work queue. But my question actually um, for Dr. Collada was, I, I think you touched on it and that was how many of you had to change computer software systems? I mean, that the system just wasn't um, really capable. I think you answered like the system probably does more than people are comfortable with. Um, but one of the things we're trying to analyze right now is, is it the system or is it the, the people? And there's some of that in between, and I don't know a lot. I, like, I wasn't in a, the group of people that were raising their hands that have heard about all those programs. I took a picture of that slide so I can go home and learn about all those things. <laughs> um, but you know, my thought was these programs that are up here, they must help um, digitize the process regardless of what computer system you're using because clearly all of us probably are on some, you know, probably maybe 20 different systems represented in the room, who knows. But these, these things help with those systems even outside of the individual systems that our states use, question mark? Oh, yeah, so okay. um, Mike is probably the best to answer that. Um, but yes, those systems, uh, so the PDC is, uh, well, I might as well let Mike answer actually. <laughs> I'm sorry? Sorry, what? Which part would you like yeah, me to answer? Just, to use these programs, I mean, obviously what you can use them with your whatever your fill-in-the-blank system is at home. So it, it depends. And, okay. and when I say that, you know, we use DocInfo, and, we, and I had a team of three querying the website. And that was an individual query. That's not the ideal. And that's also because we had no idea we were going to get 9,000 of these. 
Um, the, the real ideal that we're talking about is what Frank defined, which is the API. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially something that is built out from FSMB and then you connect to it with your Here's computer system and it's basically a digital handshake and conversation. Okay. An interface. And Build Mike, an interface. I think, has more. Yeah, you should be good. Okay. Can you hear me? No. I can. So we have, I, I did just want to point out. Alden, I, I, it, perhaps th that answered your question. All of the systems uh, that we have here are A, at no cost to our member boards. Um, they are, uh, you know, we're, we're, if, if there's one that maybe has, you haven't been trained on, that can be arranged very quickly. Uh, I think I would reiterate we have, a lot of it is online, but we're seeing more and more. We're seeing a lot of uh, activity with new products and new systems being installed and more interest in the APIs. APIs take a work to set up, but once they go, they're, uh, they're wonderful. So we're seeing some more activity there as well. Thank you. And I should emphasize on those products you saw earlier, each one was designed with a different focus. Micah mentioned DocInfo. That's more of a public website for individuals to look up things. But FCVS is a true credentials verification. It comes in a report form. But again, as Micah said, um, we are working with various state boards to create those APIs to integrate with your systems. So I hope that information was helpful. Speaking, and these are some good questions about technology, a question that's come to my mind, and then we'll turn it over to the mic as well is when we talk about moving to these APIs and if we move to all this, what is our licensing and our IT shops, what do they need to look at? I mean, we've talked about, and I've heard from you know, everyone talking about uh, one of the hurdles being maybe people don't know how to use the systems. And, and that's something I fell into, you know, um, and that's uh, quite honestly one of the things I still fall into, just people don't know of all the tools available to Office 365. So what do you guys think uh, their, that our IT shops are gonna need to look like? Well, I think they're going to have to be uh, 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 have the availability of understanding what is available, what we are using, and what improvements it will bring to our workflow. Because quite frankly, if it doesn't improve our workflow, I think we need to can it and go on. And the lady who spoke earlier just asked me, what are the things that I use to change my people's mind, my employees' mind? It was very simple. We showed them that the system they had was not very useful to them because whenever we received a document, we updated them by an email that they had to individually type and send. And they said they send that to the person and they, they, they would say, we got this from you, we got your FCVS, but we haven't got your fingerprints. Well, what we did was we computer, we automated all of those, so everything, anytime a document was entered, the email goes out automatically, they don't have to do anything. But more importantly, we established a patient portal because I saw that, I mean, a patient portal, I apologize, that's my, my medical background, an applicant portal, a licensee portal, because we saw them answering hundreds of phone calls a day. What's the status of my license? Why can't I get my license? What's missing? And of course, we've sent them emails, but they're still checking. So now, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We don't care if it's three o'clock in the morning. They can go on their portal and find out that we still don't have the fingerprints to send for the criminal background check. We got their FCVS. We got the letter from the dean or whatever it is we need. And they can check off what they want and what they didn't get. And they can find out the, so they can help us. Because we still believe that the burden of providing the information is on the applicant. But our biggest, I don't know about anybody else's, but our biggest holdup is criminal background checks. And I was really interested, and I wish Mr. Matthews would comment on it, because he really made, he, he set off a light bulb in my head when we first started discussing this presentation about his view on criminal background checks. And I really, I'm not going to steal his thunder. <laughs> <laughs> Micah, please right. tell us. So let me just go ahead and throw the grenade in the room. Um, we're exploring the concept of discontinuing them. Uh, specifically, not, not the state level one, but the FBI level one. And the reason really comes down to what I said yesterday about we look at our data, and that's the reason we discontinue renewal questions. We weren't getting positive hits over three years. It was less than 1% of a positive hit, and even then it wasn't that big of a deal. But with our FBI, we looked back five years, and I, I, I forget the, the bottom number, but it was something like 10,000 FBI background checks. And out of that 10,000, we got 19 positive hits. Tellingly, 
all 19 declared those hits on their application. So we didn't, we didn't learn anything new. So it really does come down to what are we getting out of that? And I know that, that Dr. Dr. Collada has, has a different uh, experience with his background checks, um, but, but simply it just raises a lot of questions. As we go to that digital age where we're trading all of this data through all these different databases, one, it makes it easy for the medical board to have an all-in-one stop shop and not rely as much necessarily on the practitioner applicant giving us that information when we can just get it verified somewhere else. But if we're able to get rid of all of these other things, we really need to be asking ourselves as state medical boards, what if we're setting the floor for licensure, floor for entry into practice, what are the things we really necessarily have to have? What do we need to actually be getting? And one classic one that we looked at when we revamped our licensing application is does work chronology matter? Do we, we used to ask for lifetime and explain any gaps of 12 months or more. And, you know, number one, legally, we can't take any action on that. Uh, it's, not, it's not justifiable. It's not a board action. It's not criminal. It's not excessive malpractice. It's simply a work history. And it was a nice to know. Really, that's not necessary to issue a license. It doesn't fall within what is in our statute of what is required to know to issue a license. So I would encourage everyone, as you're going through this process of, of looking at how to become more digital, how to issue credentials faster, and my own personal mantra is zero day licensure is a possibility. We just have to get there. Um, as you're doing that, look at what's necessary to ask. Do you really need and I'm going to pick on Arkansas because I was born there and I went to, uh, to school there, go Red Wolves. Um, they used to, up until a couple of years ago, require you to come into the office for an interview. And uh, back when my dad got licensed, he had to bring his physical diploma from UAMS uh, in there even though it was in state. Is that necessary to issue a license? I think we can all agree that's probably not the case. So just be thinking about, as you're going through this process, how can you slim down the application? How can you slim down what you're asking for and what is really necessary? And I think it's, if we're really being honest, the stuff that FSMB has access to through all the various databases covers at least 90% of what we need. And it's just a matter of building out the API and reaching out and touching each other, state medical board to FSMB and beyond. Question from the mic. Thank you. Um, George Zakos, Executive Director in Massachusetts. Um, we're trying to step away from some of the paper, um, for example, state license verifications. I know OIG requires the Medicaid fraud control units to report adverse actions within 30 days to ensure the NPDB is up to date. I love Physician Data Center. I'm hoping we could utilize that rather than state license verifications. But from your perspective, uh, Mike, do you feel the states are reporting the information in a timely manner to ensure we're aware of adverse actions when we run the reports, or do you feel the metrics aren't really showing complete compliance from all the states, if we want to rely on that for state license verifications? We, we focus, we have a team, uh, the, several of them are in the room, fo that focuses on nothing but that. The currency of the data, the frequency of the data, and uh, and the quality of the data. We put, we have tools and they all match to make sure information is attributed to the right physician. If it doesn't meet the highest uh, standard, we go into a manual mode and do that. So I feel confident saying that they, they are timely. I, I would probably go a step further. I don't know if anyone's seen the OIG report regarding the VA and the reporting of hospital discipline. I think the biggest issue with any kind of discipline reporting is not the systems you query, but the reporting to the systems that we all query, whether that be coming in as a letter or checking a board's website or the data that goes in. But that's a separate topic that I don't want to kind of sidetrack us on. Anything else to add to that question from the panel? Responses? I was just going to say, I mean, um, if someone doesn't report to the national PRAC, the national PRAC is then outdated too. So, I mean, it's the state reporting or whoever, the hospital reporting. You know, you can't control that 30 days, but I think the PDC is just as probably more accurate than the national PRAC. Question from the mic. 
Thank you. Uh, my question is related to the provider breach. So what will be the main difference between the provider breach report and the physician data center report from SCBS? And this has a cost? Is, is it, you, you, the question was, uh, the main difference between the, the provider bridge the, report the and provider the bridge report and the physician data center report that FSMB you can get from SSMB. So it's a uh, first of all is the way it's it's delivered. So the provider bridge is built. Uh, there's two p there's two entry points. There's institutions that can load up uh, a list of names. Uh, they have to. Uh, request and we go through a vetting process to make sure that that this is an institution that uh, has a need to know and that it's a uh, an accurate or a authentic request and so we vet them they have their logins uh, and then providers themselves can go on and because this information it's almost like the out-of-wallet questions and also there's there's no protected information you can go on and if you have the fields, create the ID and pull your report. Um, so that, that's the delivery mechanism versus with the physician data center, we have, uh, you know, boards, uh, all boards have open access to it uh, and can, you know, pull a report on any physician. You know, provider bridge would be, you know, just physicians that had been, uh, it's not a new central database, it's really a mechanism to, to pull that report and make it portable. Uh, physician data center, uh, medical boards, and we do have, it has a, a hospital uses as well, uh, will go in and maintain their rosters, and then their physicians are available. You can add physicians to the roster, uh, get alerts, etc. So, does that, does that answer the question? Yeah, and it has a cost additional? I'm sorry? A cost? Oh, uh, the, no cost to medical boards. Uh, if, if for the, uh, the uh, uh, hospital users, there is a profile fee, uh, you know, to, to access the system. And I, and I should report, too, or uh, note, the report itself is different. The Physician Data Center report has more details. So we have the licensure. Uh, that has active licenses. The Physician Data Center report has all licenses, active and inactive, and it has information about like issue date and uh, renewal date. So it's, it is much more of a, a credentialing and licensing tool uh, versus the uh, provider bridge was just, is this person a, you know, a credible uh, healthcare professional? Thank you. So one of the other questions I kind of wanted to touch upon um, that came up through some of the discussions leading up to this is uh, we, we've referenced a lot with the IMLCC and how that has affected licensure times and improvements. And there's been some discussion at other panels. But I guess I, I have a question. Is there are problems applicants are having and medical boards are having that the compact doesn't solve? I know a lot of people would respond and say, well, just join the compact. That'll help expedite license. And I think it, it does do that to, uh, to a certain extent. But are there other, are there other problems that licensure, or other licensure problems still exist that the compact doesn't resolve? Yes. <laughs> Could you elaborate? Um, in excuse, excuse me. In Louisiana, we are required to have CMEs to be licensed as a physician. Uh, we cannot, through the IMLCC law, put a hard stop on a renewal. We have to give the renewal and then go back and do what amounts to an audit. We got out of the auditing business after we got severely criticized for only auditing 2 to 3 percent by the Louisiana legislative auditor, who I'm not sure if your states do this, but we have what's called a performance audit. They're not worried about our dollars and cents. They want to know are we doing what we're supposed to be doing. And if you can, you can imagine they spent 18 months in our building and uh, looked at records that we just couldn't give them enough of. But what they told us was 2 to 3 percent is not adequate to provide the protection to the public. And oh, by the way, you didn't do it for one year and you lost all the documentation for two other years. So we, utilizing an API, and you've heard us kicking that term around, we brought an API together with one of the credentials, warehouses, for lack of a better term, and we now have a hard stop on 100% of our standard renewals 
whether they be MDs, perfusionists, or whatever, when they put in their application, it pings the database of the warehouse, says they only have 18 of 20 hours. We tell them, we're sorry, we cannot renew your license at this time. You need to do eight, two more hours to get your credentials up to speed for your CMEs, and then we allow them to renew. The IMLCC, we have to do that retrospectively, but that's one of the problems with the IMLCC, because you, start, you actually change your state law to conform to the nine data points and nothing else. Mike or Christine, any comment? Yeah, I was just going to say, with the compact, um, they collect limited information, and I think um, most states want everything. And that's where, you know, FSMB can come in to play because, you know, it is a primary source and we can get all the information, um, you know, through the federation rather than going back to the state. I know um, we have issued compact licenses and then we get PIAs from other states wanting all of the underlying licensure documents. So again, it's just this whole, you know, like we don't, they want the paper. Um, and just getting back to the earlier question, Frank, about, um, you know, like how to move staff forward. Um, what we did was we just kind of ripped the Band-Aid off and we implemented the UA and um, we took the paper application off the website you know, and we really just said, you know, this is how it's going to be, and um, so far everyone's had, continues their jobs, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I'm glad to say they continue jobs. Mike, any comment? Yeah, I would say that um, just to address this, the staff and their job worries, uh, every time I've heard that, I assure them that I, I have 150 years worth of paper applications in the state archives that we will have them call back and scan in and digitize and they'll be employed till 2050 uh, at least. So with respect to the compact, I would say that it's a good solution for expediting licensing. It's not a good solution for license portability. Uh, and, and I think we're, we're seeing that in some of the critiques that we get about about the compact, whether it be a, uh, creating a large administrative burden that, with all due respect to other specialties, radiologists have been dealing with that for years and they've done it fine. Um, but it, I, I admit, it is a pain to maintain a bunch of licenses, pay all those fees. Uh, but at this point, I don't see something supplanting it. Uh, and it has addressed the issue of timeliness, as I said, just not of cost and redu reduction in administrative burden on the part of the licensee. Well, and I think one thing that people tend to forget about is that for the compact, you have to have a license before you can do anything. So regardless, you're always going to need some sort of process to do the vetting for that very first license. And I think this is something that even um, most boards will have to do, which actually brings me to the next question. What is your average, what is an acceptable time frame? Michael, you mentioned zero day licensure, which I think if it's, yeah, I would say it's a dream. I think one, as long as day, fingerprinting you know. is a requirement, I don't know if we'll ever get there, but maybe Washington State will be the first. But, um, but leave, put zero day aside. What is, what is in your mind acceptable? And I know we talk about auditors and the legislature and what they think is acceptable, but what, what for your boards do you guys consider acceptable in terms of licensing, ter licensing time frames? Uh, we have, um, within 10 days of the last um, document, qualifying document, but that, that, and that's usually the CHRC, the criminal history record check. But I mean, I, I've told staff, I think they should be able to do it within two weeks, really. And that's always within, I, I, I've said that a lot in my role, prior roles at ED, it's always within the uh, receipt of the last document. Um, is it, generally, do you know how long it's taking you, because again, it is on the doctor to provide those records, but do you know generally, have you ever measured the data and the time frames from start of submission to the closure of an app? Weekly, yeah. And generally for that, how long are you looking at? Um, it depends. We, we just launched into a busy season with residency licenses, so everybody else is taking a back seat a little bit. Um, but I think the last quarter we were at 2.4 weeks total time. From you when the applicant starts the yep. application, gives you the we have, document. We have a 14-day from, from the date of last document thing, but mm -hmm. that doesn't, I, it's, it's not accurate. And I don't, yeah. think, I don't think it's a fair assessment because I've issued a lot of things. I'm 100% in 14-day, but there are some of those apps that were out there for yeah. Like yeah. four months. 
you know? I guess my reason for that question is just, uh, you know, how many of those were waiting because of paper? And I think digital, you know, if, if we have the verification, Dr. Collada hinted on that it's, or identified that it's still the responsibility of the applicant, but mm -hmm. if it's digital, I mean, that information, 14 days gets down to hopefully zero, but probably not for a little while, because that information should be hitting your systems instantaneously. Right. Um, I want to be mindful of time. It's 3.20. We still have about 10 minutes. Are there any other people in the audience that have any questions, comments, concerns, praise? One thing I do want to hint on, um, or not hint on, but touch upon is Dr. Collada. I know Louisiana, um, beautiful city by the way. Um, you all have been looking at We've talked a lot about zero day licensing, we've talked about APIs, we've talked about integration, but Louisiana is actually looking at a true digital credential, not a issuing a paper credential, but an actual digital credential. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, um, in Louisiana we have something called LA Wallet, was an was a idea of our governor, uh, and it's uh, been effective now for about six years. It's your driver's license in your digital device, whether it's your cell phone or whatever. And it's very handy and very convenient. And during the COVID situation, we, Louisiana Department of Health went to, with the same contractor and all of our COVID vaccine cards are actually in there. So I said, wait a minute, I'm part of the Department of Health here as the LSBME. And we got permission from the Department of Health to use the same contractor pricing. And we're gonna be bringing on our medical licenses from the Board of Medical Examiners, whether they are any class, about 15 classes and they will actually be in your cell phone. And the, the way it works is very, very much exactly like the driver's license bureau works. Uh, you open up your digital uh, license and it will ping the system and the system will send back the current credential and, usually, and it will say uh, last updated five seconds ago, last updated two minutes ago. And so basically as soon as we take an action against a license and put that in our system, because what literally happens is the contractor for this API, if you will, this, this process will ping our database, look at the status of the license, and return that to your cell phone. So it may say expired license, or it may say suspended license, or it may say restricted license. But whatever we have on as the current thing will go right into that system. And we're, I'm, my, I'm waiting for the contract to come from the vendor and then have my lawyers look at it and we'll get that going as soon as we can get all of those contractual issues done. Um, he's a Louis, I'll be honest with you, it's a Louisiana vendor and if you'll, my email address, I'll just tell you, you can send it to me and I'll send it back to you. My email address is vculotta at lsbme.la.gov. So I'm going to ask the panel just to give each one of you an opportunity to make any comments or questions or any issues you want to raise. Dr. Claude, is there anything else you want to add to the group? Yeah, you heard the term earlier, digital infrastructure. One of the reasons people didn't like our system when I first got there was we had a 20 megabit bandwidth. We now have 3 gigabits and a 1.5 gigabit switch over in case one fails. But I'm going to say you build redundancy. I lose night sleep sometimes over security and operational ability. Uh, just to give you how, how, the, how the worst possible things can happen despite the best planning, we put in a, a fairly expensive generator in our system to back up our data center so that we could operate no matter what. Ran 36 hours after the electricity went out with Ida and then the engine blew up. The company did replace the entire generator ultimately, but uh, it was a disappointment to me. But nonetheless, I think you have to protect your data, you have to back up your data, and you have to give a lot of redundancy because we so heavily depend upon as you move into this digital era, you have to have the infrastructure supported. Christine? No, I don't have anything further. <laughs> Micah? I would just challenge all the state medical boards to be constantly looking at your, what you're asking for licensure. Uh, be constantly looking at your, if you have personal data questions for your application, you know, ask is, is it necessary? We recently just got rid of asking about all physical, mental uh, conditions simply because when it comes down to it, the, 
debilitating conditions that someone would have that would prevent them from practicing medicine are really not our business and they would not be able to practice medicine or even apply on our system anyway at that point. Um, so it, it, and that was done in concert with our PHP. So I mean, we're, we're constantly rev revising how we're doing this and trying to slim down and take things out. Um, and it's not to, the, to our experience the detriment of the experience of our staff, the applicant, or the, the public at large. So I'd always encourage you to be looking for that change and evolution. And it does get much easier when it's all electronic. Oh, Christine. I, I actually thought of something. I was going to say um, collaboration, because the more I collaborate, the more I seem to learn and be able to cut the process um, and make it more efficient. So collaboration, um, you know, we've done that on CMEs, we've done it with FSMB, um, I'm doing it with DC and Virginia, so I really think collaboration is, is a big part of it. Thank you, that's huge. Mike. Well, and we would love to collaborate with all of you, and I, I know we can help, and we have some uh, great work we're doing with these integration projects. Perhaps next year we'll talk about, hey, look at the, all the success we had with these. But uh, there, uh, and we, we have, uh, uh, you know, capabilities where we see states with these integrations think it makes a difference, and uh, we're here to we're here to help. Thanks, Mike. And I'll add to that. I, I really want to emphasize that we're here to help part of it all. You know, this is, these services that we showed, PDC, FCVS, Provider Bridge, DocInfo, those are services built for the public, for the boards, and we're here to help and provide those services. And those, those are not the end-all, be-all. As Mike pointed out, we're working with some integration programs. Uh, we want to work with your systems to make these systems work uh, smoothly. Uh, but we also want you to trust them. I think one thing we'll have to do a little bit better on next time is maybe talk a little bit more about security, cybersecurity, and things like that. Um, because those are things that are definitely the flip coin of it is once you do trust it, we need to make sure that it's secure, which it, it is, and Mike's team looks at that, but we'll have to touch upon that. But as Mike said, hopefully next year we can do a follow-up, give you guys some project updates, and maybe have some new uh, individuals that want to participate in that. Um, please be on the lookout uh, for many emails from Mike or I as we maybe try to find some individuals that are willing to participate, and anyone that is happy or excited to do so, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. You have Dr. Collada's email, I'll go ahead and give you mine. It's fmyers at fsmb.org. That's F-M-E-Y-E-R-S at fsmb.org. Feel free to reach out to myself. Um, I don't know, Mike, if you want to share yours or not. I, I'm happy to forward them to you. Uh, <laughs> Sure, and I'm, we're, we're very consistent. I'm M-D-U-G-A-N at FSMB.org. And um, thank you again for all taking your time, being involved in this discussion, and look forward to what the future brings. Thank you.